Auckland, New Zealand. Auckland's roads and parks and the Waitakere Ranges nearby are the training grounds for many of the world's great middle distance runners. 30 years ago, before the elaborate physiology labs of today, these hills were where Arthur Lydiard, experimenting on his own body, developed the training system that revolutionized middle distance running. Following in his footsteps came champions like Peter Snell, John Davies, and Murray Halberg, and later, training on the same principles and the same paths, Rod Dixon, John Walker, and Dick Quacks. Here they have refined and adapted the world-renowned method to their own needs. In addition to his own training, Dick Quacks is turning his attention now to coaching, applying his experience as an Olympic medalist and world record holder to training a new generation of long and middle distance champions. Few coaches anywhere can claim more success than Dick Quacks. Arthur Liddy himself was a distance runner, and perhaps his greatest contribution to middle distance training was the huge increase in aerobic training undertaken, basic cardiovascular conditioning. The program that I've developed is a fully rounded one, training both mind and body for top level success. It stresses balance, a well-balanced program balancing both aerobic and anaerobic training. Progression and moderation, progressing from one logical step to the next while moderating the training between hard and easy days. Individuality, each program should be tailored for the individual and variety using a variety of training locations and methods and we'll show you how to set up a communication system for you and your coach during the base building phase our training looks something like this Sunday a long distance run this varies greatly from runner to runner many milers like John Walker will run up to 22 miles Others may consider 10 to 12 miles a long run. I recommend that both the 800 and 1500 meter runners be well enough conditioned to be able to run up to two hours. The benefits of long runs are not always apparent to someone racing the mile. The reasons we run long varies, but simply put, it lays the foundation of aerobic conditioning. Physiologically, it improves capillarization, and there are indications that during long distance running, fast twitch muscle fibers are recruited to do aerobic work. And it lessens injuries by lessening the stress of workouts. Monday, long fast distance. Because running needs to be specific to the event, long fast distance is also a very important part of our build up. Again, as in the case of long slow distance, the distance and the pace will vary from runner to runner. Usually the course that I use is flat or undulating, either on roads or on grass. The faster I want my runner to go, the more likely I am to use roads. Running on roads costs less energy than running on grass. I want my runner to achieve a high heart rate for a sustained period about 150 to 160 beats per minute. This is the kind of information that needs to be recorded in a training diary so that you and your coach have a record of your improvement. Every morning, immediately you wake up, you should record your resting pulse rate in your diary. A diary is an invaluable aid for you and your coach. After any training run, record such things as where you ran, the distance, and the time. Other things that you should record are weather conditions and how you felt during the run. I use a scale of one to five. One being very fresh and five being very tired. Tuesday, another long, slow distance run for recovery. Long, slow distance runs allow you to train with companions of differing ability. Women athletes have very few advantages over their male counterparts, despite what some popular running magazines may say. Perhaps the only advantage that she may have is in the area of flexibility and mobility. As a result, she may be less prone to injury. But let's look at some of the disadvantages. 
Remember, though, that the top woman will always beat the large majority of men. Some of women's disadvantages include less power, lower maximum oxygen uptake, lower blood volume, fewer red cells. Overall, the physical efficiency of women is about 20 to 25% down on a man. The differences that may exist in the ability levels between males and females have no effect on general training methods or results. The same principles apply with all athletes of differing abilities. The five minute miler and the four minute miler train much the same, only the pace is different. Wednesday, intervals. During the conditioning phase of our program, we keep the intervals long and slow. If we are doing 800s, the pace is set at about 20 to 30 seconds below the best race pace. This is so that the intervals remain aerobic and we can do a large number. I try and avoid the track at this point and do the intervals on a grass field. A man who appreciates this type of work more than most is John Walker. John Walker has carried Peter Snell's mantle as New Zealand's number one miler during the 1970s and 80s. He was the first man to run under 3 minutes and 50 seconds for the mile, achieving that feat in Gothenburg, Sweden in 1975 with a time of 3 minutes 49.4. Currently John Walker has run the most sub 400 miles of any man in history. In 1976, John Walker won the gold medal at the Montreal Olympics in the 1500 meters. I think you've got to really define the difference between interval and speed work. Uh, a lot of people think that interval training is speed work, whereas I don't really uh, ever put too much emphasis too much on speed. But I think interval is very, very important because there are so many people that go through the emphasis of putting a lot of work into mileage, running 100 miles a week, and then neglect possibly the most important thing of the lot, which is interval work. Now, some people do interval work on the track, some people do it on hills, or in other words, fartlek type running, where they do speed sessions, sprinting, jogging on hills for a certain period of time. Mainly what I do is I work on a set period for about 10 weeks prior to going onto the track. And normally I'll select an undulating piece of road around about three quarters of a mile and I do reps on this piece of uh, usually Auckland domain and what I do is I'll probably do say five of these reps once a week and I start off at the beginning of the season running three minutes and 40 seconds for one three quarter mile repeat now most athletes uh, caliber of track runners would probably find this very easy but what I try and do is take a shorter recovery and I normally work on about two minutes per recovery and I try and do at least five of these type reps. After about three weeks of doing interval type three quarter mile repeats, I never do any more than five, and then I start bringing it down a little bit and running 800 meter repeats, finally down to 400s and a, probably the odd week of 600s. None of these are done at full effort, always on the road and very, very seldom on the track. I find that too many athletes try and do their intervals on the track. I found after years of experience that doing them on the grass or on the roads, that I've had less problems on the road than I ever have doing them on the track. Doing them on synthetic surfaces these days tends to put more emphasis on troubles with Achilles tendons and knee problems. The cause of these types of problems is obvious. The tremendous repetitive strain hard running puts on your skeletal and connective tissue. Your choice of running surfaces, as well as shoes and types of workout, will determine your success in avoiding those problems. You can see why hard training that's too long, too hard, and too early in your career can be counterproductive. Moderation and variety are vital. John Walker's use of interval training is built on a basis of extensive distance work. Long before I came a sub four minute miler and also became a sub 350 miler, my coach placed great emphasis on long distance running, around about 90 to 100 miles a week. This was usually done in 10 week periods prior to moving into interval work and then finally into speed work. I felt it was always very easy to go out and plod. If you're going to be a sub four minute miler, that philosophy doesn't really work. Today, if you want to be a good sub four minute miler, you've got to really run a little bit faster tempo. I personally find that at least once or twice a week, I'd like to run at least five minute mile pace. And I usually run this up to about 10 miles. If I feel that I'm not 
going too well and I'm not getting that hard distance run in, sometimes I'll even move onto the track and run up to 5,000 metres at a much more concentrated effort. You've got to realise that all through the training period, it's a building up period, it's not a breaking down period. Thursday, long fast distance, an undulating course. Training can become boring when you do the same thing in the same place every day. For this reason, I like to vary not only the training, but also the training venue. Psychologically, it can give you a bit of a lift to be able to train somewhere new. Present day training systems use a variety of techniques in combination. Each technique has at one time or another been hailed as a great breakthrough in training and put above the rest. In the 1890s, English professional runners like Walter George and Al Shrub were using distance running, interval training, as well as more fashionable techniques like special drinks and long walks. The times that they achieved were respectable even by today's standards. In 1886, Walter George ran a mile in 412.8. Al Shrub covered up to 90 miles a week in training. But somehow, their training methods were forgotten or ignored for quite a few years afterwards. In the 20s and 30s, the great Finns, Hannes Kuhlemeinen and Pavu Nurmi, emphasised interval training. Considering the small amount of distance work they did, their times were outstanding. But they were not much better than the 19th century English runners. Even more amazing was Glenn Cunningham, who held the world indoor mile record in 1940 and ran only about 15 miles a week. The experience of the previous 50 years had passed him by. In the 1930s, there was a breakthrough in Sweden, and for a time, the Swedes dominated world running. They introduced Fartlek. Literally translated, Fartlek means playing with speed or speed play. I generally break it up into 10 to 15 minutes of warm-up, followed by some hard efforts of three to five minutes, maybe four or five of these. I recommend that after each effort, take the same time of active recovery. A fartlek session can take as long as you want it to. At the beginning of the season, it should start off fairly easily, and as your condition improves, make it a little harder by cutting down the length of the recovery. Steady state running, tempo running or time trials are all used in order to help us become more efficient. Steady state running for an 800 meter runner may only be two miles, but in the case of a miler could be up to six miles or 10,000 meters. By steady state, we mean that our heartbeat, respiration and blood pressure are all at a high but steady state. The courses that we use need to remain the same and be accurately measured in order to be able to chart improvement. All too often, progress is halted by injury. A sound program of stretching performed every day will help reduce the injury risk. Hill bounding is used to aid speed development. Generally, hill bounding begins once a high level of conditioning has been achieved. In place of hills, stadium steps provide a suitable alternative. Sprint drills are now an important part of every middle distance runner's program. They are used to increase stride length, leg drive and leg speed. Quick stepping. Remember, move the arms as quickly as possible. Take very short steps. Repeat this twice over 50 meters. Skipping. Remember, straight back leg on your toes upright. Repeat this four times over 40 meters. Leg flicks, four times 40 meters. Remember, body upright on your toes. Stride extension, four times 20 meters. Remember, body straight, back leg straight, lead leg extended as far as possible. But back to the basics of the Arthur Lydiard program. Peter Snell was possibly Arthur Lydiard's greatest protege. In the early 60s, he set six world outdoor records, two world indoor records, and lowered the world one-mile record twice, from 354.5 to 
to 354.1. He was never defeated at either the Olympic Games, in which he gained three gold medals, in 1960, the 800 metres, and in 1964, the 800 and the 1500 metres. He was never defeated in the Commonwealth Games, where he won the 880 yards and the one-mile double in 1962. Currently, Peter Snell, who has a PhD in exercise physiology, is working in Dallas, Texas. He is still a strong and enthusiastic proponent of the Athletid system of training. 25 years after Athletid first propounded the ideas of uh, long-distance training, particularly for middle-distance runners, the methods are still relevant today. A lot of people at the time wondered how it was possible that uh, running around the roads at six to seven minutes a mile pace could be possibly be of any value for someone who was wa wanting to run under one minute 50 for the half mile on the track. The secret lay in the development of endurance. Lydia had realized that an individual who ran up to 100 miles a week could do far more race relevant training on the track. Now we have a physiological basis for these methods. The endurance performer is able to, to handle a lot more work, lower levels of lactic acid production. And in this way, he's able to do perhaps 20 quarters instead of 10. The adaptations that take place in muscle allow him to sustain a high percentage of his VO2 max uh, during the race. The process of distance running, only a fraction, a small fraction of the muscle fibers in the running muscles that are available are being used. And therefore, there is uh, an important interaction between running speed and distance to make sure that, uh, that uh, all the muscles are finally utilized. This will occur when those that are initially used become depleted of glycogen. And so a runner at seven minutes a mile, for example, uh, may not uh, deplete, uh, start to deplete glycogen until uh, maybe uh, uh, as far as 15 miles. And in the course of uh, uh, a 20-mile run, uh, we're getting into a different uh, muscle fiber population, especially the fast-twitch fibers, which are normally not utilized unless the, uh, the exercise is extremely strenuous. This is possibly why uh, individuals who do uh, uh, interval training uh, can also uh, train these uh, uh, this fast twitch fiber population. However, almost by definition, the amount of interval training that you can do is much less, uh, and that uh, I feel is one of the big advantages of long slow distance. There are more rewards to running than just winning races. After about 10 weeks of the type of basic conditioning program outlined so far, your pulse rate should be down your VO2 max should be up and you should be feeling great. Now let's look at how this is achieved. Sunday, long slow distance. A long run is taken in order to A, recover from the previous day's work, B, be able to work for a long time, C, recruitment of muscle fibers, and D, to increase capillarization. Monday, long fast distance. Same as the day before, but we are working at a higher heart rate and closer to our anaerobic threshold. Tuesday, long slow distance not as long as a sunday but again to help recover from the day before wednesday intervals long and quite slow again in order to do race specific work thursday 
long, fast distance. As Monday, but perhaps vary the distance, either longer or shorter, depending upon your state. Friday, Fartlek in order to bring variety into the program and also for race specificity. Saturday, steady state or time trial. Again, for race specificity, working at a hard, high rate and pushing at the anaerobic threshold. Then it's back to Sunday. This program should be continued for a period of about 10 weeks. Having completed your build-up, now comes the time to get into some real pace work, anaerobic training on the track. Anaerobic training, or oxygen debt running, is one of the less pleasant experiences that a middle distance runner will have to face. However, during an 800 metre or a 1500 metre race, a large percentage of energy comes from the anaerobic source. In order to withstand the stress, we will have to train for it. This type of running should not be done too often, as it is very stressful and furthermore, the potential for improvement is limited. 36, okay, over the 200. There are a number of workouts which can be used to improve one's anaerobic capacity. One of my favorites is to run 300 meters at about 85 to 95 percent effort, and then run across the track to the 200 meter mark. This should take about 30 seconds. Then run 200 meters at approximately the same effort. The runner then rests for about six minutes and starts again. This is repeated three or maybe four times depending on the athlete's condition. Twenty-five, twenty-six. Good, Pete. We've got six minutes to your next one. The reason we use the five to six minute recovery is that this is about the time it takes to remove 50% of lactic acid from the system. Anaerobic intervals improve speed endurance and help create buffers against lactic acid. They differ completely from aerobic intervals, the type seen earlier, which help develop the rate at which your body can extract oxygen from the air and transport it to the muscles, your VO2 max. The types of training that develop VO2 max, as far as studies are concerned, uh, are both endurance training, training of the long, slow distance type, and also interval running, about uh, equal amounts. Uh, it's felt that there may be a different mechanism for the improvement in VO2 max, because endurance running operates or, or develops more the local muscle blood flow, whereas the interval training probably puts more uh, work on the, on the heart itself. Part of how much the heart can pump depends on its ability to, uh, to relax and fill during its relaxation phase. And so this is usually uh, reflected in a larger heart in trained athletes and it's possible that, uh, that more intensive running, such as interval work, better develops this characteristic. However, as everyone knows, while a high level for VO2 max is very important, it doesn't account for the differences in top level athletes. And it is the ability of the muscles to be able to sustain their work and utilize a high fraction of the maximal oxygen uptake that is important. And this is where I believe a uh, long, slow distance plays a very important role. Tuesday, long, slow distance in order to help us recover from the hard work of the day before. Long, slow distance should continue to play a very important part the whole way through your running program. Wednesday, a steady state or tempo run.
Thursday, another day of anaerobic intervals. Friday, back to the track to develop speed. Again, it's worth considering some of the techniques used by sprinters for speed development. The catapult is one of these techniques, forcing the legs into overspeed and training the nervous system. You can get a similar effect with a hill start. For a slightly longer run with the same effect, you can try this. But I seriously suggest that the driver is a friend. Saturday, a time trial. Time trials are used as race practice and as a step towards peaking. Sunday, back to a long slow distance run for recovery. All training is an adaptation to stress. When our body adapts to stress, we get a training effect. However, if the stress is too severe and the rest not sufficient, we are not training our bodies, but breaking down. Obviously, there is a very fine line between how much stress our body can tolerate and how much we can't. This is where our training diary becomes an essential part of the system again. We use stress indicators as a guide to the way our body is reacting to stress. Perhaps the most simple stress indicator is the AM pulse. We wake up in the morning and take our pulse. If it is four to five beats higher than normal, it is an indication that we haven't completely recovered from our workout. Obviously, you can't keep track of your training without these records. The second stress indicator is our morning weight. If this has dropped significantly, it probably means that we are becoming dehydrated. Another stress indicator is our subjective feeling of thirst. If we feel more thirsty than normal, we probably are dehydrated. If you are overstressed, you must be prepared to ease up or to take the day off and relax. You also have to be able to relax when it comes to peaking. Lay off some of the hard training. When it comes to peaking, John Walker is the master. Peaking is a very, very fine art because once you've done all the mileage, you've done the interval work, and you move slowly into speed work, and you have a odd few races, the fine tuning is the most important part. Too many athletes that I know don't do this. It's very difficult, of course, when you've been running 100 miles a week, you've done long repetition work, you're used to running up to two and a half hours in one particular day, and then all of a sudden the coach says, well, no more than 30 miles a week, and today we're only doing two reps instead of 10. And a lot of athletes really can't see the purpose of this, but you've got to realize you don't want to leave your racing on the track. You want to leave it in the performance on that particular day. And I've, as I've seen, I've seen far too many athletes in the past that haven't peaked right on the particular day. Normally, the last week before I go into an Olympic Games, I usually tend to do under distance rather than over distance, which means 150s, 200 meter repeats, and even trying to sprint, which is 50 meter repeats out of the blocks. You can also use minor meets to peak and experiment with your tactics. Find out what your strengths and what your weaknesses are. Tactics for middle distance running usually fall into three categories. The first one, and probably the most obvious, is the kick. And Peter Snell used that most successfully, as did John Walker and Steve Cram. The thing the about the kick the is the bunch, that if you are bunched at really the final the lap, the all the potential winners must decide when the to go. Once that decision has been made, it must be carried right through to the finish. You must know exactly at what point you can hold your speed right to the tape. 200 meters left. And watch Van Dam right on behind John Walker. He's very strong. Walker's got the front. He's got to stay there. Walker Van Dam Coughlin. Welman coming strongly. Perhaps the less obvious tactic is the even pace running, and that's what Dave Wattle did in the 1972 Olympic Games. And perhaps the most difficult 
is what Philpott Bayer used during the 1974 Commonwealth Games, and that was to lead all the way from the front. Whatever tactic you use, the key is to be positive and see yourself as successful. Before a major event, you must run the race repeatedly. You must run every lap and know every move right through to the tape. You can do it. Given some natural ability and the kind of training program that I've set out. Let's go over some of the main basic points again. Balance. Balancing aerobic with anaerobic training. Moderation and progression. Moderating hard work with recovery periods. Progressing. Sometimes when you talk about progress in distance running or middle distance running, we can talk in terms of years. Make sure that the program is tailored to you as an individual. Keep your training program varied. By varied, I mean vary your locations of training and methods. And setting up a line of communication so that your coach can help you. Ovet's cruised into second place in the New Zealander O'Donoghue's about to make his move. Ovet got caught knocking a bit and O'Donoghue's quickly got around Scamlin. Now Ovet's been forced to go up the 200 and then Forbes. O'Donoghue a metre in front. Ovet about to challenge. Two metres to Scammell. Five metres to Forbes. O'Donoghue straightens up in front. Ovet's got to call on all his reserves. O'Donoghue's just in front. Ovet won't get him. O'Donoghue's in front of Ovet. He's got him beaten. And then Scammell, and the New Zealanders going to win, and it's going to be fast.